Hello, health champions. I'm sure you've heard all kinds of amazing health claims about kombucha and apple cider vinegar. So in this video, we're going to go over the truth level of some of those health claims, as well as the strengths and the weaknesses of each one. First of all, apple cider vinegar is made from fermented apples and kombucha is made from fermented tea. But we need to understand that you can't really ferment tea. You need to have a sugar source. And the source for apple cider vinegar is the sugar in the apple. But for kombucha, we have to add some sugar. And it's usually just table sugar, but it could be raw sugar or something a little bit different. But just a basic sugar source. And then in the fermentation process, when we make vinegar, we run that process to completion until there's no sugar left. Whereas in kombucha, we run a partial fermentation. So there's going to be sugar remaining depending on how long we run the process. So obviously, therefore, in the end product, the apple cider vinegar has no sugar, but the kombucha is going to have some sugar residue or even significant levels. The acetic acid is what makes apple cider vinegar what it is, and it's typically at around 5%. It's standardized to that level. And in kombucha, it's going to vary a lot. So when I looked it up, they said that a typical kombucha has about 1%, but then when I try to find that on the product labels, there was usually a whole lot less. Sometimes as little as one hundredth of that level in there. And there's been a fair amount of research on apple cider vinegar. And what they're researching then is not always apple cider vinegar. Sometimes it is, but more often it's just white vinegar. So it's the acetic acid that gives the vinegar the properties that we're looking for. And it's been noticed to reduce blood glucose and A1C, keeping all other factors constant. It can help reduce weight and belly fat. It can help lower triglycerides and cholesterol. So basically all of the factors associated with insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. And they're not really sure about the exact mechanisms, but they have some ideas. They know it improves insulin sensitivity and signaling. They know that there seems to be some improved satiety with it. And also that the liver is going to put out less glucose. The liver is typically what maintains glucose between meals. And it can either do that by breaking down stored glycogen or it can make glucose through gluconeogenesis. But either way, with apple cider vinegar, there seems to be a little bit less of that. And finally, acetic acid is a short chain fatty acid. So you've probably heard about MCT oils, that MCT oils can give you some energy, but it doesn't trigger insulin or blood sugar. So it's like a fast energy. And short chain fatty acids are even faster than MCTs. So that's one potential benefit that it gives you a little bit of energy and that might also contribute to the satiety. One more good thing is that these short chain fatty acids also become food for your beneficial gut bacteria. Kombucha has also had some research done and the main thing that they've been focusing on is antimicrobial. They found that it has significant activity against gram-positive bacteria and gram-negative bacteria, but we've also heard claims that it helps for yeast and candida, and when they checked that out, it showed that it had no effect at all on candida. They also wanted to find out if it was the acetic acid or the tea or something else in there. So when they did the studies with tea alone, even when they went like super concentrated tea, they found none of these effects at all. So they concluded that basically all the results that they found was from the acetic acid composition. And in this study, they used a concentration of 33 grams per liter of total acids, and we'll talk about what those are, and seven grams per liter of 
acetic acid. So they also recommended that if you were looking for these benefits, then you probably want to use a product around that kind of concentration. But in kombucha, the acetic acid may not be the primary thing that we're looking for. There are a lot of other things in there. The acetic acid is about 5% of the total acid, but then there's glucuronic acid at 65% of the total, and that's been found to assist in liver detox. And also this glucuronic acid can help balance hormones, sex hormones specifically like estrogen and testosterone. A third common substantial acid is gluconic acid at 30%, and that has been shown to support the growth of bifidobacteria, which are some of the most beneficial of your gut bacteria. But in addition to supporting your gut bacteria, kombucha actually contains some of these bacteria. So it's pretty high in probiotics. Bacillus coagulans, S. boulardii, and lactobacillus can be pretty significant. So if you look at a label of one of the better products, and better I say because it's one of the larger brands, they brew traditionally, and they're brave enough to put some stuff on the label that a lot of people don't have. And when we check the total levels here, we find 1 billion and 4 billion and 4 billion. So that's 9 billion organisms. That's not as much as some of the most potent probiotic products on the market. They can have up to 50 or even 100 billion bacteria, but it is more than some of the more basic or cheaper probiotics on the market. So it is pretty substantial. But we need to understand some of the issues around kombucha if we're trying to get these benefits that we're looking for. Acetic acid, like I said, when I looked it up, they said that it should be around 1%, which is 10 grams per liter. When they did the study, they had a total of 33 grams of acid and the acetic acid was seven grams per liter. So their study was a little bit less than what I read was typical. But then when we add up from this label, which again is one of the better brands, we find 100 plus 75 plus 1400 plus 650. And when we multiply that out, it's 4.7 grams per liter, which is about one seventh the study they ran had seven times more total acid in their product. And when we look at the acetic acid specifically, 75 milligrams in a bottle multiplies out to about 1 44th of the amount of acetic acid that they had in that study. So if you're looking for some of those benefits from acetic acid, you would have to drink a whole lot. In comparison, one third teaspoon of apple cider vinegar would give you that same amount of acetic acid. But there's some more issues we need to know about, not because they're necessarily good or bad, but so we know what we're getting. And the first one is sugar. Kombucha can have anywhere from zero to 20 grams per serving. So that makes a big difference if you're trying to watch your sugar. You start off with tea and sugar when you make it and you add a SCOBY if you want to make it yourself. Then SCOBY stands for Symbiotic Culture of Bacteria and Yeast. So it's both yeast and bacteria that's going to ferment this sugar. And the first thing we get is the yeast eats the sugar and turns it into alcohol. And then the bacteria of various kinds turns the alcohol into acetic acid and some of the other acids that we talked about, as well as more probiotics and another SCOBY. That's kind of like a bonus. You start with a SCOBY, you end up with two, and you can use both of them again. And a typical recipe is going to have somewhere around a cup of sugar per gallon of tea. That's about 60 grams of sugar per liter. And as we run the fermentation, we're going to get less and less and less sugar. So most of the time, they stop this process about halfway. That would get us about 15 grams of sugar per bottle. And if you run it longer, then you could get closer to zero. But there's some labeling issues also. So sugar is a concern, but oftentimes they try to tell you 
that if it's total sugar, if it's not added, if it just sort of happens to be in there for whatever reason in the product when they start, then it's good, then it's a natural sugar. Whereas if they add the sugar, then it's white sugar, and then it's bad. And that's not really true because 99% sugar is sugar. There's not really any difference. Your cells and your liver, by the time it's in the bloodstream, they don't know the difference. The fructose is still gonna clog up the liver and the glucose is still gonna spike insulin and blood sugar. But a lot of companies try to be sneaky because they know people don't like added sugar. So if they start off with a juice instead, if they mix the tea with apple juice or pineapple juice or kiwi juice, now they don't have to list it as added sugars because fruit juice counts as zero added sugar. It still contributes to total sugar, so it makes no difference there, but they're kind of tricking people to think that it's way more natural and it's like that much more natural and it doesn't make a big difference. Kombucha can also be done in a traditional way where you ferment it straight through according to certain rules or it can be from concentrate and sometimes they put that on the label and sometimes they don't. One way you can know is if it's diluted. If one of the ingredients on the label, one of the first ingredients maybe is carbonated water, now you know that they made it from concentrate. And I'm not totally opposed to doing it from a concentrate as long as you preserve the bacteria and the things you're trying to keep in there and as long as you sweeten it with something that you can tolerate. If you put regular sugar back in, now you could be right back to these levels. Or if you use something else that you may not tolerate so well, maybe a sugar alcohol, for example. And sugar alcohol could feed some of the bad bacteria in sensitive people, and that would defeat the purpose of taking kombucha with a probiotic in the first place. And maybe most importantly, make sure it's not pasteurized because a lot of the benefit comes from the probiotics, from the bacteria. If you pasteurize it, you kill all of that off, you might as well just drink sweet tea. And also in some cases, they actually add the probiotics after the fact. And again, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but you have to ask yourself, why do they do that? If they run this process traditionally and they let this culture thrive and develop, there should be probiotics in there. So if they have to add it, then maybe they messed with the process somewhere along the way. Now let's look at some of the benefits and compare side by side. And apple cider vinegar is best known for its insulin resistance benefit. So we get a big check there, that's the acetic acid again. Kombucha, like we said, at best, it's going to have one-fifth, but oftentimes much, much, much less acetic acid than that. So it's very questionable whether you're going to get much insulin resistance benefits from kombucha. When it comes to probiotics, on the other hand, it's kind of flip-flopped because apple cider vinegar, while it does have some bacteria, they're mostly uh, bacteria associated with acetic acid, not so much other bacteria, and also there's not very much of them, not nearly as much as in kombucha, which again runs in the billions. Antibacterial, the apple cider vinegar is because of the acetic acid. Again, the kombucha, it's kind of questionable because of the very, very low levels. Digestive benefits, they both have, but probably for different reasons, because we know that the acetic acid with its lower pH can have some digestive benefits. We know that both of them support probiotics, pro support the, the biome in different ways. Apple cider vinegar has the short chain fatty acids that support the growth, and kombucha has other acids that support the growth plus their probiotics and so forth. So they're both pretty beneficial for the digestive tract. And they also both, through the studies, have shown to have antioxidant benefits. So I wouldn't look 
on kombucha or apple cider vinegar as some magic pill that's going to solve all your problems. But I do think that both have benefit as an add-on if you start changing the other things in your life as well. If you start moving toward a healthy lifestyle, they can add a little bit of edge. So if you like kombucha, then do your research, read the labels, make sure that you have something where they list the bacteria and the acids because again if they don't list it then maybe there's nothing in there maybe their process isn't as particular as you want it to be you can also call the company with some hard questions about is it from concentrate what kind of bacteria are in there is it pasteurized make sure it's not pasteurized or if you have the interest and the time, I think it's always a good idea to make it yourself because that way you control the process, you know exactly what went in there. The only thing is it's a little time consuming, but you will save tons of money. So if you make it yourself, I would personal preference run it a little bit longer than, than like the halfway point. And you can buy something called a Brix meter that will measure the sugar percentage content. And I would run it not to zero, because then I think you lose some of the bacteria, but run it a good bit beyond the halfway mark. And then you can dilute it with something that you know what it is. And if you like bubbles, you can carbonate the water before you mix it. And finally, you can sweeten it with something you know what it is, like stevia or monk fruit that's not going to add a bunch of sugar. If you enjoyed this video, you're going to love that one. And if you truly want to master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell, and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.